Welcome back to Crypto Trade Secrets. We have an exclusive here. This is going to be fired up. Fantastic time. Um, I would like to welcome all <laughs> Henry and Slanyan from the crypto, uh, the Asia crypto market of Price Waterhouse Coopers. How are you, sir? Always great to be here. And I feel as Times Square with two hours left to go. Like the, the ball is going to come down. We're going to celebrate New Year's Eve. <laughs> yeah, I, well, between your energy and mine, we should actually blow up Times Square. I'm already talking all over myself. <laughs> I'm super excited for this. Um, but how are things? How, how are you holding up with the with the pandemic and, and COVID, the COVID situation on your end? Well, you know, Tyrone, it's, it's actually, I actually believe the whole situation, despite as, as bad as it could be, is also I think it's very beneficial for the digital assets industry. I think mm. we're realizing for the first time people don't want to touch paper money. With all the wave of quantitative easing we're seeing, we're seeing more interest in digital assets. So I think uh, a lot of the changes going on right now are going to catalyze some of the changes that the digital assets and the crypto ind industry and the fintech industry has been forecasting for some time. So from our perspective, I think it's quite an interesting time, despite the, the difficult conditions that we all go into right now. But I think together we're all going to emerge a bit stronger uh, post uh, the situation. I love it. I'm fired up. So let's get to why we're all here. Jump into your presentation. Give us the jewels. <laughs> Awesome. First of all, uh, thanks, Christine and Tyrone. Yeah, obviously, one of the things that we've done at PwC, as you know, our, our job is really, our purpose is to build trust in society and solve important problems. And one of them is actually the whole crypto hedge fund industry. And this is actually quite important, not personally for me, as you know, I started my career as a hedge fund lawyer, and I spent many years in the hedge fund industry. But really, when it comes to a lot of institutional investors that we talk about, for many of them, their first entry will be via funds. So this becomes very important. And this is why we launched this crypto hedge fund report. And really, the way we approach this is very, very straightforward. We partner with Elwood, uh, Elwood Asset Management. Really, with them, they provide a lot of the qualitative data. And then PwC obviously would come into play, as you see on the next slide, with a lot of the qualitative input that we can actually together come up with a report that is very valuable. And this is our second year. And what's really important when you move to the next slide is you'll see that we really focus on the crypto hedge fund vertical of the industry. Again, we do not cover index funds in the same way as the traditional hedge fund industry does not cover ETFs, for example. And we do not cover crypto venture capital in, this, in, in the same way that in the traditional hedge fund industry, uh, we, you know, we exclude VC and PE. So we're really focusing on the crypto hedge fund industry, which is, I believe, one of the most important area industries to focus on. And when you look at this at the next slide, you'll see it's become super interesting. When, when we compare it to last year, we realize the global AUM has doubled in the, in the past 12 months. But even, what's even more interesting is that the proportion of funds that have an AUM of the over 20 million went up from 19 to 35 million. And why this matters is actually that we're seeing a lot of the big funds get bigger. And this is something you see across the asset management industry because for a lot of the investors, they have limits that they cannot be, say, more than 5 or 10% of a fund. So if a crypto hedge fund is $10 million in the UM, uh, you cannot accept the ticket of more than a million dollars. And this is why actually you see a lot of the funds get bigger and bigger. But this being said, when you move to the next slide, you will realize that really um, the, the average AUM and the medium AUM has doubled in the, in the past year, which is quite exciting from that perspective. But what's even more exciting is that you look at the median hedge fund grew 4x since launch. Here I have to put a big caveat because, you know, with all of these reports that we do year after year, there's a survivor bias. So obviously the funds that did not perform obviously are not in existence anymore. So the funds that are still in operation are the ones that were able to grow four times. And this is what, Tyrone, it really makes performance very, very important. And what you'll see on the next slide is that the average crypto hedge fund last year generated 30% in return. And what you'll see as well across the spectrum, many of these crypto hedge funds did what they had to do, which is basically provide uncorrelated returns or absolute returns. A great example are the quant funds. Last year, when Bitcoin was down 72%, the quant funds were up 8%. This year, when the Bitcoin is up 92%, they're up 30%. So you really can see that actually as quant, uh, quant funds are, are generating returns, really they, what they need is volatility. They don't Really, it's a bit uncorrelated from market uh, performance. But a lot of other strategies are related to the market. So if you go on the next slide, you'll see that last year, in a year where Bitcoin was up 92%, the best performing strategy were discretionary long only funds where they have a lot of exposure to the beta of the market if you want. And this performance matters a lot because it relates to the fees that these hedge fund managers will get. And this is actually very interesting. When you move to the next slide, you'll see that while the median hedge fund, the average fees 
of management fees and performance fees have remained the same at 2020, we've seen overall management fees come down from 23.5 to tw almost 21%. Uh, sorry, the opposite, actually, from 1.7 to 2.3%. And there's a couple of reasons to explain this. One of them is actually that running a crypto hedge fund today has become more expensive than it was a couple of months ago, just because the cost of regulatory compliance, getting their service providers, and actually we're seeing investors be comfortable to pay that extra management fee in, ex in exchange of the funds being ready to implement those best practices. However, that is still not enough. If you think that the, the median of a crypto hedge fund is $8.2 million, like I mentioned before, and they charge 2% management fee, that just brings them revenue of over, just over 160,000 US dollars. And if you consider it, the average crypto hedge fund has about six employees and has to pay obviously rent and office space, it's almost impossible for them to even break even. And this is why it makes performance fees quite important. But this is why also you see a lot of fund managers have become put in place a lot of fund terms. If you move to the next slide, you'll see which is a very anomaly compared to the normal hedge fund industry that almost two thirds of crypto hedge funds have either a hard lock or a soft lock. What is a hard lock? It's basically the amount of time that no investor is about allowed out of the uh, based on their contract to redeem. And also what is a soft lock is you're allowed to redeem, but in exchange of a hefty penalty that goes anywhere from three to 10%. And this is quite interesting because um, while this allows a lot of hedge fund managers to lock up capital for a certain amount of time, what happens in practice often, these investors will sign a, a side letter that will reduce the fees that they have to pay. But what's even more interesting is when you look at the gates, 60, almost two thirds of crypto hedge funds have in place gates, which is again interesting when you consider a lot of the strategies that these crypto hedge funds have are quite liquid. And this, for example, is not something you see in the traditional hedge fund industry with a lot of these liquid strategies. But this can be explained when you look at the type of investors that crypto hedge funds have. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see that around 90%, 9-0 of the investors in crypto hedge funds are family offices or high net worth individuals. And while there's a lot of positives to that, you know, investment tickets can be written quickly. Uh, there's, uh, they're a bit more relaxed on some of the fund terms. Uh, the, the downside to that is actually a lot of the tickets are smaller in size than, than what a lot of the VC funds or endowments, foundations, even pensions, of course, could pay. For example, if you see on the next slide, uh, out of, out of in, uh, last year, the, the median crypto hedge fund, their investment, the ticket they had was $300,000. And the medium crypto hedge fund had almost 28 investors. That's a lot of headache for anybody who's doing investor relations. And this is something we expect over the next couple of years, the number of investors to go down for a fund, but the average ticket size to go up. But another of the changes we're probably going to see is on this strategy. If you go to the next slide, you'll see today that the vast majority of crypto hedge funds in the market are quant funds. And this is normal because there's a lot of volatility in the market and there's actually a lot of uh, money making opportunities for a lot of the quant funds. Uh, but over the next couple of years, as the industry becomes more mature, there's, there's you know, more liquidity, there's actually more hedging instruments, and the industry just matures, we should, we should see this mix to balance it out. But also, as long as we have this mix of funds, we should probably see the same type of um, mix of assets being traded by funds. If you go on the next slide, you'll see that we actually surveyed all the crypto hedge funds and come up with the type of instruments that they're trading. And here, what you see is actually the top 10, you know, ballpark, if you look at the funds, are kind of the top 10 uh, cryptocurrencies by volume as well, by market cap as well. And again, this is the, one of the reasons a lot of the quant funds, they, they generally trade a lot of the assets that are very liquid. This is why you're seeing a lot of big parallel with the funds that the assets are trading and the ones that from a, from a market cap and liquidity perspective. But one thing, well, I don't expect this to change a lot over the short term. What I expect to change is when you go to the next slide, which is super exciting, which is when you see that almost 70% of uh, crypto hedge funds, 69% are allowed to short, and today almost 48% are shorting. And this is something that as a lot of the more crypto hedge funds, you know, start focusing on being absolute return, and there's about more lending and shorting capabilities in the market, this is something I expect to see increase. But even something that I expect to see even increase even more is the middle data on derivatives. Today, almost half of the funds in the market are using derivatives. And this is something probably when we come back with the survey next year, we should probably see increase, not only because there's more um, derivative exchanges now uh, av available globally, but also there are, there are some derivative exchanges that we all know that are now regulated and that are also in the US, which is something that was didn't exist before, that may provide, um, uh, maybe to cater to the industry. 
But also one other thing we should see, which is super exciting, is the next slide, which is when you see some of the what I call the yield en enhancement activities. So a lot of the funds we're seeing today, this, this is the first year we're tracking it, uh, almost 42% are actually involved in staking. And almost 38% are actually involved in lending activity. Again, when it comes to yield enhancement, this is one activity that's very interesting that we're seeing a high proportion of funds uh, be involved in. But also, we're seeing a lot of the trends being driven by the investor base. For example, when you go to the next slide, you'll see that compared to last year, uh, we have now 81% of the crypto hedge funds that are using independent custodians. And this is clearly something that is being driven by investors who care not about the investment due diligence, but also the operation due diligence. Another example is when you look at the presence of independent directors. I can tell you putting my lawyer hat on, this is something uh, that you'll see on, on the next slide, which is that it went from 25% to 43%. And this is super important. If you consider that some of the terms like gates and others that I just mentioned before are actually can be enacted, not by the fund manager, but by the independent by the directors of the fund. So another big trend we have is the next slide, which we've seen the percentage of funds using independent third-party research jump from 7% to 38%. So again, it shows a lot of when it comes to uh, capital allocation, a lot of the hedge fund managers are focusing, getting the, the research and focusing on the areas where they're able to generate alpha. And I'll finish up with two last slides, which is really the percentage of, of fund managers using a fund admin. It's at 86%, which is excellent. I hope that we're going to see this number go up over 95% in the coming years. There's no reason today that any crypto hedge fund is tracking its own NAV, it's not a net asset value itself. And the last slide I'll finish it off is really the domiciles. Today you'll see again that very similar to the traditional hedge fund industry, the majority of the funds are based in the Cayman Islands and in the US. But what's even more interesting is when you look at where the hedge fund managers are based, which is a column on the right, we see again that half of the hedge fund managers right now in the world are based in, in the US, followed by the UK. And, you know, again, for anybody who's watching this, they want to get a copy of the report on the next slide. I mean, you'll see my details. Uh, I mean, you can find me on LinkedIn, on Twitter. And also just Google PwC Alba Crypto 2020 report. You should be able to get this report. I'll stop it here. I hope this was insightful from that perspective. Thank you so much, Henry. I do have a few questions for you. You had mentioned that in 2019, discretionary, discretionary long only funds were the best strategy by far. 2020 is a big year. We've got the halving. We've got this COVID. Tell me, what do you suspect is going to be the best strategy for hedge funds in 2020? Where is the money to be made? Tell me a little bit about how hedge funds can capitalize on what's going on now in 2020. Uh, absolutely, Gracie. I think that's a great question. I think it depends really how the markets evolve. So, for example, what the data of the last couple of years shows us, if the markets actually, crypto markets just perform, uh, those are actually uh, uh, long only should benefit of that market beta and be able to benefit from that rise. However, for example, there's a lot of market volatility. That's where we're seeing a lot of the quant fund benefits. Again, for a lot of these quant funds, what they need is actually a lot of market volatility, and that's how they're able to perform. So I would really look at the dynamics of the market and where we are, and that probably is a good indicator of, of what type of hedge funds should uh, perform relatively quite well. All right, so I'm going to jump in here. Not necessarily the question, but we have to get your thoughts. Paul Tudor Jones, it was all the rage. Oh, did we lose him? No, of course, I'm still here. Of course. Oh, okay, I can't, I can't see you. Uh, but anyway, so so please give us quickly your thoughts on, on Paul Tudor Jones and, and you know, obviously him di diving into the space in a letter that they put out. Absolutely, Tyrone. I think there's a lot of stuff. I, you know, his letter was very interesting. I think, there's, I think we should expect to see more hedge fund managers enter the space for a couple of reasons. One of them is regulatory clarity. I want to, you know, Tyrone, today, only 5% of regulators don't have somebody working on crypto. So we've had a lot, over the last two years a lot of regulatory clarity, which gives comfort to institutional investors. Second is institutional service providers. Today, there's a lot of providers in the market who are SOC, SOC 1, SOC 2, that are audited. That, that, again, gives comfort to a lot of the investors. But also another thing I would mention is really the adoption of best practices that we mentioned today. And last but not least is really what's happening around the world, not only with uh, developments like Libra and central bank digital currencies, but frankly, which was one of the reasons given by, by, by Paul Tudor Jones, was the whole quantitative easing that we're seeing in the market in an era where central banks are really expanding their balance sheet. Bitcoin is really expanding it by half in a, in a monetary policy that is really predictable, transparent, as it was set up a decade ago, and that is very transparent and predictable. 
Thank, Thank you, you so much, Henry, for your presentation. We have to wrap up our trade secrets show now, but up next on Coindesk TV is Battle for the Base Layer with Coindesk reporters Brady Dale and Will Foxley. Brady and Will will be talking about the technologies that could possibly unseat Ethereum as the number one general purpose blockchain platform. You won't want to miss it. It's coming up right now.